Welcome to the Big Screen Symposium podcast. This session is from the Big Screen Symposium held in Auckland on the 9th and 10th of July 2022. In this panel discussion, Sustainability Manager and Steering Committee Member for Greenlit, Rose Archer, Producer and Greenlit Chair, Craig Gainsborough, and Vector's Senior Sustainability Partner, Dr. Prageeth Jayathissa, shed light on the enormous sustainability challenges faced by the screen industry. They offer practical methods and tools to help film productions reduce their environmental impact, meet local and international carbon reduction targets, and reduce waste in the screen sector. This session is presented by ScreenWrites. Just to be a little bit more explicit about that introduction, I've worked myself as a sustainability manager in the screen sector for the past year. And yeah, Craig is a producer and has been a driving force behind Greenlit. And Pragreeth is here to talk a bit more about carbon footprinting and um, some of what Vector's doing as well. So yeah, without further ado, tell us a bit more about Greenlit. Well, I was just going to say quickly, um, we'll need to be with Rose. She's, uh, her voice is struggling a bit today. But, <laughs> but it's... Um, the, so Greenlit is basically an incorporated society which has been made as an, as an industry-led organization. Um, there's about 14 of us, and we've been working for the last year quite hard on uh, basically trying to create some tools and resources to support the New Zealand film industry in implementing sustainable production practices on set. So, yeah, industry-led organization. Um, we're kind of all from you, and there's a really great team behind it. And so just a note that um, we will do some questions as we go through, but most of the questions we will do at the end. So please, if you have any questions that come up for you as we're going, do write them into the app and we'll either get to them as we're going through or at the end. Prakith. Kia ora tato, ko Prakith toke ngoa. Kei te mahi o i te Vector Limited, ko Senior Sustainability Partner toke mahi. Kei te kōrero nai nai me mō te... Climate change, me decarbonisation. So I'm just going to give you a quick one-on-one on climate change and decarbonisation. Now, I'm sure many of us are well aware, and hence here, in fact, 80% of New Zealand's population is deeply concerned about this. But what some people don't always realise is that the impact on Auckland and Tamaki Makoto especially is quite intense. We're actually one of the more affected countries and regions in the world. And it's not because the temperature is increasing. That's all good for us because we get warmer summers and warmer winters. But it's the fact that the air holds more moisture, so the rains are going to be stronger and the dryness is going to be more intense. And this is a problem for our city. Um, and here, and you know, within my work at Vector, we look after, I look after a portfolio of nine companies across, across the Mutu and also in Australia and internationally. You know, when I look at the energy infrastructure in the Auckland region, which we also have Kaitiaki over, we are already preparing, right? We are already moving assets and moving things around because of the flood risks. So we need to kind of look at it from an adaptation, but also a mitigation. How do we actually avoid the most severe impacts of what's going to come? So I usually always like to start with this lovely graph. This is uh, courtesy of the Ministry for the Environment. And they have done this incredible piece of work where they've taken the entirety of New Zealand's emission portfolio and summarized it for the average human being. And what's quite um, remarkable when we see this is just, first of all, the two key areas where we emit emissions into the atmosphere, and that's from the agricultural sector and, and the energy sector. Now, of course, I represent the energy sector and do quite a lot of work in this particular space. Um, but then when we also look at the agricultural sector, you'll notice that a lot of it is cows and sheep, just those two animals, 45% of our national emissions. The final 5% of emissions down here, that's the rest of our entire agricultural industry, right? All the pigs, chickens, all the vegetables, all the fruit, everything else is just 5%, while two animals take up a significant chunk. When we look at the energy sector, it's 20% 20, 20 transportation. That's predominantly our own private vehicle usage. Then, of course, we have manufacturing and constructing. This is just our you know, manufacturing industries. We have electricity generation. And there's 5.5% other is all other energy. So diesel generation, for example, which some of you might use in your film sets, is, comes into this particular category. And then finally, the waste up here, it's only 4%, and that's because waste is predominantly methane emissions to the atmosphere. So it's only food, organics, you know, wood, organic products going into landfill, they're the things that cause emissions. Plastic going to landfill does not. It's quite important to understand that. So 
what do we do about it, <laughs> right? What do we do about this thing? So, you know, the doom and gloom of climate change is not really a thing anymore. I think we're going to avert, you know, the catastrophic extension of the human species and all biodiversity. I think we're kind of on a good trajectory to not do that. Um, the goal at the moment, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the goal at the moment is to try to keep our emissions to below 1.5 degrees, and that will avert kind of a lot of the sad times for a lot of coastal line people. So how do we avert and how do we keep to 1.5 degrees? And the general rule of thumb is we need to cut this graph in half. Um, we need to basically reduce 50% of our emissions by 2030 based on kind of a 2019 baseline. That is the 2019 baseline. So we need to slice this pie graph in half. And that's ultimately the job that we as a nation need to do. Now, Slicing the graph in half is a job for everybody. So we at Vector, for example, are doing quite significant work trying to decarbonize the energy system and you know, transition the energy system to a low carbon society. And at the same time, all organizations and all industries and all individuals need to also take up the responsibility of how do we, in the next eight years that we have left, knock out half our emissions. So even things like working from home from a personal perspective, that already helps in that process because you're not driving to work. I myself have got rid of the car completely trying to kind of cycle and use public transport because that knocks out quite a significant amount of my emission footprint. We need to start tackling climate change from a scientific perspective and not a gut feel perspective. Over the last 10 years, quite a lot of us have been trying to do actions because it makes us feel better, but we haven't really been taking it from a scientific methodological approach on how do we actually mitigate the risks. And it leaves people feeling really helpless. It leaves people feeling lethargic. It feels like, oh, I'm doing all this stuff, but it's not doing anything. Um, so how do we kind of approach that? And the first step, and the most important step for everyone is that you need to actually measure your impact, right? The impact that you are having on the environment. And this is what's known as measuring one's carbon footprint. So once you, as an individual or your organization, here we're talking on the organizational level, the moment your organization has a good understanding on what your direct emissions to that is, you can then work on cutting that in half. And this is a process, the Ministry for the Environment have set up this really amazing document called How to Measure Your Organizational Greenhouse Gas Emissions. Just Google it, it's a phenomenal resource. All companies throughout New Zealand are using that as the base of how we then calculate our carbon footprint. Once we've understood that, we can start the reduction initiatives. And this is where things get really fun and really exciting. So I've recently run this through Vector. So Vector is a conglomerate of nine reasonable energy companies across the country and in Australia. And we've found out that we can reduce 50% of our greenhouse gas emissions, more in fact, and save money in the process. We are able to develop, develop and deliver better customer services. And our entire offerings and products have increased as a result. This was not possible if we did not have the measurement to then go and try it directly and put you know, direct scrutiny on how we deal with this problem. So, for example, a, a simple example, this is a very small chunk of our emissions, but still it's our, our, vehicle, our actual vehicle fleet. When you look at an electric vehicle and a petrol vehicle, on a total cost of ownership, the electric vehicle still today is cheaper than the petrol vehicle. On price tag, the electric vehicle looks more expensive, but when you take into account the maintenance costs on an EV compared to a petrol vehicle, when you take into account the cost of the fact that electric runs at 40 cents a litre and petroleum is like $3 now, and the fact that at the end of life, your electric vehicle still has value in five years' time, but your petrol vehicle, you're not going to be able to sell in five years' time. And when all those calculations are put into account, you suddenly realise, actually, it's the better business decision to get an EV fleet now than continuing having a petrol fleet. So that's one small example. There's thousands of others. But overriding, we're able to knock down a significant amount of our operational emissions and save money at the same time. And this is partly because there's so much good alignment at the moment. There's great political alignment, we've got great market alignment, we've got great community alignment. 80% of the country is really deeply concerned and cares about climate change. We have legal alignment. There's amazing kind of lawsuits and litigations that are happening at the moment all around the world against high polluting industries. And of course, there's the economic and financial alignment, right? The investors and the people that are providing money are only now providing investments. For example, green bonds are 20% of all investment debt instruments and growing in number. So if your company is not moving towards a sustainable trajectory, you effectively do not have a future. So a lot of the work I do is actually on a business continuity and maintenance perspective as opposed to being sustainable, which is now no longer a thing you do on the side. It's the core part of your entire business and corporate strategy. I've got a question over there. Um, so uh, if Jessica can put my 
question. So do you think uh, the news media in general exacerbates the kind of doom and gloom of climate change and kind of leads to people being lethargic about the whole thing? And do you think uh, the big corporations that run these kinds of stories are kind of knowingly doing that? So interestingly, the doom and gloom part, I, I like to think is the third generation of climate change denialism in this kind of concept. Like, there's a first generation that said climate change is not happening, we're not going to do anything about it. The second generation said uh, climate change might be happening, I'm just going to kind of reduce my plastic waste and that's enough, that's all I'm going to do. And the third generation is saying, oh, okay, well, this is way too hard, we're, we're it's an existential crisis, so it's not going to work out. We need to be quite careful of that and, and as you very rightly put, we need to make sure when we're framing our stories, we're not framing the doom and gloom situation, which we now scientifically know is not likely to happen. We need to really get the hopes and the people that are doing great work and get those stories up. And also, um if we, hypothetically, if we were to completely decarbonize by next year, would the Earth go through a healing period of cooling and changing its weather cycles? Um, everything that's already locked in is locked in already. So the impacts that we've created up till now, of course, there's still the impacts are going to come. If we can decarbonize by next year, I mean, that'll be phenomenal, but I don't think we're going to get there. Um, and, and feel free to ask questions now as well. It's a good time while this topic is still fresh before we get into the, the, the deeper details. If, if you can put them through the app, though, that would be really helpful because yeah. then we can read them up here and, and keep a tack on them as we're going. Now, the, the next part beyond footprinting is a thing that I'm really passionate about, and that's the carbon handprint. So the carbon footprint is the emissions that I as an organization or I as an individual create upon the environment and then I work on reducing that 50%. This is kind of the old generational, the current way that we're dealing with climate change. An agenda that I'm, I'm pushing quite strongly and I think it's very important is the idea of the carbon handprint. And that's how do I reduce emissions outside my organizational boundaries and how do I help others reduce their emissions? So for example, um, just going back to Vector again, Vector is an energy company. We we don't have any influence, you know, we don't have transportation as part of our business portfolio. But if you remember that graph at the very start, transport was 20% of our greenhouse gas emissions. I'm not going to pull the slide up, this should be in your head now. Um, transport is 20% of our greenhouse gas emissions. So how do we as, an, as, a, as, a, as a major energy company help the transportation sector decarbonize? So a lot of that work is about how do we get the infrastructure, the electrical infrastructure set up in a way that we can enable that transformation or that decarbonization of transportation in a way that, is, that works, it's not causing barriers, and also in a way that enables a continuation of, well, a mitigation of energy inequality. That's something we're really concerned about, that the fact that the, the wealthy part of the population are going to have cheap energy and, you know, are, are going to you know, benefit from all this while the poorer population are going to be stuck with the really expensive petrol cars. So how do we solve this problem and use our position as an energy company to decarbonize that part of the footprint, the New Zealand footprint, even though it's not part of our footprint? So that's the carbon handprint. That's our impact on the wider environment. And the more we start thinking about the others over ourselves, we kind of move away from like a neoliberal solution to climate change to a more community oriented approach to climate change. And I think this is where we're going to have the biggest benefits. And it's where I also kind of challenge members of the film community, for example, to say, you know, what is, you know, your footprint is your internal emissions that you create as part of your business, but your handprint is the way you touch and influence and change other people. I love it, for example, when I watch a, a, a film or a documentary and I, and, I, and I see people taking sustainable modes of transport and they do all these things because sending those clear messages as opposed to the protagonist driving a fossil fuel car and being all cool about it or the depressed person taking public transport and making the whole thing look so you know, bleak and glum. Like, why do you need to always be depressed on a bus? I mean, it, <laughs> it frustrates me. <laughs> Anyway, that's, that's just generally a one-on-one, and I hope that sets the scene, because I think now that really comes to the next part of, you know, starting with the carbon footprint. I mean, what, is, what does the carbon footprint of the film industry, you know, look like from a kind of a we, first look? We, we don't really know. So this is uh, one of the really challenging things that we've got in New Zealand. You know, in the UK in 2011, Albert was formed, and uh, it you know, the commissioners there in the UK uh, made it mandatory for productions to be reporting on their carbon emissions. So that was 11 years ago. In New Zealand, we have, we have not had those and we have not 
most of our productions are not reporting on their carbon or even keeping a track of their waste or carbon emissions. And it was revealed that 53% of people don't know whether the productions they are working on are measuring their carbon footprints and uh, waste. Now, the process of measuring a carbon footprint is an all-encompassing one. It requires information from almost every single department. So the fact that they don't know, you can kind of ascertain they probably aren't, because if they were, you would, you would know. And 26% say that none of them do. So when we took those numbers and we kind of did a little bit of math, uh, it worked out that around 7% of productions, as, as a guess, loose guess, around 7% of productions in New Zealand are monitoring their impact, which is not very high. Yeah, we, we basically need more information, and that is a, a collaborative thing from all departments across all stages of production. Um, and the reason we need this is that without knowing what our footprint is, as a country in our industry, we can't reduce because you need a baseline. So what Pragit was talking about with the, you know, 2019 emissions that um, he showed for the whole of New Zealand, that forms a baseline which we can then re reduce from. Um, without that baseline, we, we can't really reduce, which, which I'll come to in a minute, why that actually is an issue for our industry right now and why it's something we need to be addressing quite seriously. For that, we need a, a carbon calculator. Um, there are carbon calculators in existence around the world for the film industry, um, but with all of those calculators, they have uh, reasons why they might not necessarily be suitable in New Zealand. Uh, we've got different um, factors. Emissions factors in New Zealand is one of them. Um, there's also a, a usability thing from... We, we've got some cultural differences to the rest of the world. There are a number of other factors, but one of the big ones is actually data. Um, is being able to track and monitor our own data across the industry. So what we're doing in Greenland at the moment, and we've actually just, thank you, New Zealand On Air has just um, provided us some support to continue this work, um, but we're building a... Uh, Woo! Thank you. <laughs> we're building a, a carbon calculator for the New Zealand um, screen sector, so one that we can use on productions so that we can track our footprints across them and trying to make that um, really user-friendly um, in the process. And the target for what we're trying to do that for is actually mostly for the local productions because um, the international productions that are coming to New Zealand are, uh, are often, that's those 7% of productions, that's generally the internationals. The reason for that is that, you know, as I mentioned before, with the UK having started in 2011, Albert, nowadays you're also seeing a lot of the big streamers come on board and uh, Netflix and Disney, for example, this last year have all released new sustainability strategies requiring a reduction in gross emissions. So that's not net emissions. Net emissions, the difference between them, for any of you who don't know, net emissions includes carbon offsetting. So it's the idea of you can make as big a mess as you like and then you go plant some trees and you've offset it. Gross emissions is actually what you're putting out there. So to get a reduction on gross emissions, you firstly have to know what your gross emissions were and then you have to reduce from them. Um, and so Netflix and Disney, um, their gross emissions reduction targets are around 45 to 50% by 2030. And their, their strategies are very clear that those targets are going to apply to their suppliers as well. And that, you know, if you think about us as, as in some ways, a service industry to the internationals, we, we are suppliers in some ways. Um, so we need to be able to know what our industry and what our productions are cr creating as a baseline so that we can therefore achieve those gross emissions. So that's sort of a, a, a bigger picture thing there. We've been pretty fine up till now with reporting through, you know, RAP and um, Peach Plus and Pear and that stuff on the international productions because, you know, they... They're probably, I'm, I'm just making an assumption here, but I imagine that they're comparing against their baselines abroad, but that's quite possibly going to change. And especially if you look at what's happening in our, you know, our domestic scene with, with, uh, at all the various councils and all the you know, public offices around the country, all, all of our public institutions are now progressively having really strong targets um, that they're needing to meet. You know, Auckland Unlimited, um, I believe your target's 50% by 2030 on reduction in gross emissions. I've got some of them in the room so they can confirm that. But, um, you know, those, those targets in 
the regional councils are, I think we're going to start to see those rippling out across industry and across everywhere. Already the government is targeting a number of industries for reductions and with reduction plans. So it's only a matter of time before the film industry is under the, is under the lens. Um, and for us, it's really important that we get on top of that so that we can actually have our best foot forward and rather than having some system imposed that we have one that actually works for our industry um, that we have kind of co-designed and created. And that's, that's kind of why there's this need for it and what, what we're doing now. Um, that's actually a really good point because, you know, with, with the work we did, we, because we led the chase, then when we started having discussions with government, they listened to us because we've already got the targets in place and the drive in place and the work in place. But the other organisations or, you know, friends of mine and other companies they weren't necessarily on that, and now they're being prescribed what to do, which is never good for an organisation because you know best for your organisation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we've got a question, Craig. Approximately when will the greenlit carbon calculator be available? So we, we want to be testing it by the end of the year. Um, yeah, so we've, we've made a start on it, and we've been working with ECOS. Um, so we actually, as well as NZ On Air, we had a really generous donation from an anonymous donor, and um, that's allowed us to make an initial start. So ECOS is our, our partner in that, in that sense, um, and now we're just looking to uh, kick off the next line of work and hopefully have a working model by the end of the year. Ah, so just around the world, um, just so you're aware, uh, similar to what we're doing here, there are a number of other... Uh, initiatives around the world. And it's really exciting because everyone's sort of talking to each other. This whole initiative around the world, is it, it feels quite unified. There's a lot of talking going on behind the scenes between all of these different groups, which is really cool. Yeah, and just wanted to also give um, some examples of the work that is happening in other countries. So we are Albert, who are um, primarily based in the UK, but they do work in other parts of Europe as well, um, have done, as Craig mentioned, industry-wide footprinting for the screen sector with yearly reviews and reports. They provided a green production guide that can be a guideline for productions to become more sustainable. And they certify, they do sustainability certifications and trainings for the screen sector. There's also um, Greener Screen, who are based in Abu Dhabi and a couple of other countries, who have done an industry-wide pledge for sustainability. And Craig was mentioning to me as well that there's another industry-wide pledge that was done in the EU. Do you want to talk to that yeah, a little so, bit? Yeah, so uh, it's like, I think it was probably around 40 or so different commissions in the EU got together and did a manifesto, uh, which basically, it, it was targeting more the producers, um, stating that uh, the commissioning bodies would support, endorse, and accept sustainability within their budget lines, et cetera, et cetera. So it was, quite, it was kind of like a call out to the industry saying, you know, we, we encourage you to, to be sustainable. Um, and a, a lot of the, the uh, commissioning bodies in the EU are now also having that as a requirement for receiving funding to have sustainability plans, tracking, and reporting. Yeah, and that is a requirement um, in the UK now because of some of the work that Albert have done. All productions have to not only footprint, but they actually have to have a carbon reduction plan um, in order to have funding. I, I just want to add to that. So I just, just this last week also I've been made aware of a new uh, initiative that's occurring at the UN <clears throat> where there's a body in the UN now looking at sustainability uh, for the film and TV sector around the world you know, what, what, what standards and, and criteria the, and, and, and initiatives should be being carried out on an international level in our sector. Something else that we saw happen in the last couple of years is um, in the Netherlands and UK, we saw huge reductions in emissions from, 2000, um, from 2019 until 2020. Obviously, we all know COVID was... Um, having some huge impacts in 2020, and that is part of the reason why we saw this decline in emissions. But I think it's valuable for us all to think about what are the lessons that we can actually learn from COVID. It's very easy to see the visible cost of COVID from a waste perspective with the PPE, but there are also some new ways that we can think about learning by 
having travelling less, by having more meetings online, by hiring more local crew, all of those sorts of things help us to reduce emissions on our productions. And then in Canada, Real Green have done a few really awesome um, initiatives. The first one that I want to mention has happened not only in Canada, but also there's a very similar project in London that they have clean energy resource maps, which allow crews to plan where they can access plug-in power on location. This is a really awesome initiative for us to think about in our industry because so many of the emissions that we're, one of the things that we're seeing from the early data is that a lot of our emissions do come from diesel generators. They also run a big Earth Day challenge where they have fundraisers for national parks and projects and they've funded some really awesome projects through that, through the screen sector. And they have lunch and learns with specific interest groups within the industry to talk about how, you know, their department or their area of the screen sector can become more sustainable. And having worked as a sustainability manager, I can really see the value in that because, you know, this conference is about the power of creativity. This is such a powerful force that we have to harness in our industry, in the work toward decarbonisation and for environmental sustainability. I know that the solutions that we're going to find are going to come from our crews because they're so creative, because they know how to come up with amazing new workflows to actually solve some of these problems. I'm not going to come up onto set and tell someone how to do their job in a totally different way. They're going to, I'm just going to ask the right questions do the research and help them come up with that stuff. But, but I think one of the things that's also in our favour as um, a little bit later adopters than the UK is, is that we can learn from all the mistakes from abroad. And actually there's a huge amount of information out there already. Um, so we're, we're busy compiling that and trying to get as much as we can. And I think it's actually going to provide us an amazing starting point to be able to leapfrog uh, into, in, into this in our industry. Cool. So um, a bit more about the sustainability department. So obviously so far we've been talking almost exclusively about, about carbon, about climate um, and about decarbonisation. The sustainability department in film has actually more risen through waste management and waste reduction, which is also a really important area of work. And it definitely has some really important intersections with decarbonisation as well. You know, we need to think about how to use resources better. We really want to push and be encouraging that our industry needs to think about decarbonisation and that there are so many opportunities for us to do what we do in a more environmentally sustainable way, for us to work with other industries to create the changes that we need to see across society, and for us then to communicate those changes outwards. So it's a real opportunity for us to be leading this change in some ways. I do also just want to talk though specifically about for the people in the room who are wondering at this stage, like, but what can I actually do when I'm on production to make us more sustainable? Like, what are the actual concrete tools that we can implement? Starting from that place of waste reduction, I'd say that there are three main strands that you can focus on here. First and most importantly is procurement. Identify the high waste products that are in your workflows and replace them with lower waste products, with secondhand products. You know, try to get a little bit more reuse of old things happening in your workflows. Also, just making sure that you've got lots of different waste streams in your production office and on set. The four main ones that I would identify that you should always have are compost, recycling, soft plastic, and unfortunately, we do still need landfill. Within a production office, there's also so many other waste streams that you can implement that I'm not going to actually go into them right now from PPD to PPE to e-waste, but a good sustainability manager will also help to give you some guidance around that stuff as well. 
Can I, can I just jump yeah, in and please. talk about sustainability managers for a second? So one of the things that we have noticed, you know, as we've been working for the last year, is sustainability is often treated as a tag-on. It's treated as, like, give the intern the job of also being the sustainability person and the, the bin wrangler. But that, that's not actually going to fix anything because that's a reactive... That's a reactive solution and it's a by thought. Like sustainability needs to be treated from a strategic perspective. It's got to be thought through upfront before people come on board. It's got to be at the onboarding phase uh, and there needs to be a plan in place from the start. Otherwise, it's, it's actually not going to achieve much. Um, and we're just always going to be reacting, reacting, reacting and never really actually doing anything like that creates you know, we want, we want a production to do well there and then be able to build on that to do well there as opposed to trying to fix a problem there, not learning anything, and then trying to fix a problem here again, which is what's happening. Yeah, thank you, Craig. And actually, I would, I would add to that to go one step further, that the best time to bring your sustainability manager on board is actually during development because the earlier that you're able to start thinking about what are going to be the right systems for us to set up for this project to minimize waste, to reduce carbon, the more of an impact you're going to be able to have, the more opportunities you're going to have to save money as well as reduce your emissions, which is what we all want to be seeing as much as possible. Um, for, for the producers in the room, if you, if like a really simple way to think about it is like treat sustainability, environmental sustainability, I should say, there's a, that's another to discuss, but treat environmental sustainability in the same way you treat health and safety. So when you bring your health and safety officer on and you've got to do all your, you know, you go through all the scripts and stuff, do the same with sustainability. The, 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 the strands are almost parallel in terms of what you need to be doing and the way you should be approaching it. Jumping back into where we're at with the presentation, the last thing that I really want to give a big encouragement to everyone to think about is just rethinking rap of stuff that could be used by people gets put into dumpsters at the end of shoots, um, gets thrown out, gets driven to the landfill. This is not necessary and it's not necessarily more expensive to do it better. You just have to rethink how you're going about it and create a little bit more time, potentially more time with fewer crew so that you're able to actually get usable resources in the hands of people who can still use those things, uh, rather than we have to wrap and get rid of everything the first day after we finish shooting, give yourself a little bit more breathing room so that you can get people to come pick things up from you from Trade Me or Facebook Marketplace or donate things or any of that kind of thing. So just trying to think about keeping things in circulation once we're done with them as well. We've, we've actually set up a little Facebook group for redistribution in the film industry as well. So you can jump on there and just yeah. take a photo and stick it up. Somebody can come get yeah. it. I think it's called Donate and Redistribute, New Zealand film industry. It's under yeah. Greenlit. Yeah. yeah. So then again, with emissions, thinking about this other side that we're talking about already, <laughs> I'd say that there are, there are, again, three main components to this. Um, we want to see ourselves reducing, you know, using, doing things like using plug-in power as much as possible, carpooling, using electric vehicles, you know, and we really always want to be putting reduce first in our strategies about how we think about emissions. Also, obviously, really important to be measuring what we are emitting so that we can think about how are we going to make a bigger reduction next time? Where are the areas where we're still having a lot of problems? And then finally, I would say offsetting is also, it's not the only thing that we want to be doing. We don't want to be saying, oh, we can just release as many emissions as we want because we're going to offset them and that's all good. That's really not how it works. We have to be doing the reducing as well. But at the same time, there are a lot of amazing projects to restore um, native forests around New Zealand that you can be contributing towards and around the world as well that you can be contributing towards. And if you're on a larger production in particular, thinking about it from like a climate 
justice perspective, it can actually be really good to be contributing to sustainability efforts in countries that are more negatively impacted by climate change, but who have also done less to create the problem. Just a good thing to think about, an important part of the toolkit. Can I add something to that? Which yes. is, I, I think something else to remember is that, you know, when we're shooting in New Zealand, a lot of the time we are shooting on um, land that, uh, you know, from a historical perspective, um, mana whenua have been there for generations and generations, and they're also who are often leading a lot of the sustainability initiatives on that land in terms of wetland um, regrowth and in terms of, you know, uh, supporting a lot of the reforestation with, the, with, with native forest. So in your conversations with iwi, you know, those can be things that you bring up right at those early stages, you know, how can we actually support your sustainability initiatives? Um, so offsetting doesn't necessarily need to be f official carbon stamp crediting system, it can actually be more of a relationship thing where you can calculate, you know, what, what would it cost us to offset this through one of those sources and maybe reinvest that into the sustainability projects of the iwi that you're working with. Um, goes down well. Thank you. Uh, cool. So, yeah, just really want to emphasize this point again. You know, all of that stuff that I just ran through that is part of a sustainability strategy it only works if everyone takes it on board. Um, sustainability has to be everyone's, everyone's job and part of the mahi that everyone on a crew is doing together. One of the questions we asked was uh, what you thought would have the most impact on improving sustainability. And um, it was kind of no surprise that education came up at the top. Everybody wants to do something. That's what's been, that was one of the things that was really uh, a, a really great takeaway is the, um, like, there was such a passion for wanting to improve our sustainability. People, people just don't know how. Um, so making, like that's one of our focuses through Green is to really make it as simple as possible. So really clear, simple steps that you can take. And then once we've got those steps down, we'll add one in. But it's not about, it's not about trying to be perfect from the get-go. It's actually just trying to be, uh, trying to do more than you are doing and then learning from it. So I, I think we kind of need to embrace imperfect first rather than be really harsh on ourselves and expect ourselves to suddenly be these bastions of environmental sustainability when we actually just don't have that culture yet in the industry. We haven't, we haven't grown it. We haven't given it the space to grow. That would be my, um, my kind of thoughts on that. And, and you can see number three there is culture, which is just needing us to actually view it as something that's integral to a production. Uh, sorry, I do want to also point out there, financial support or systems, as you can understand, <laughs> the biggest barrier to it was time and money. Um, and that came up over and over again. Um, <clears throat> and that's why I, I would also, once again, encourage you to think of it as health and safety. If you think of your health and safety budget in a production, it's, it's actually not that big. And, and sustainability doesn't need to be as big either. And there are actually a lot of savings that come through implementing sustainable practices. So there's actually partially some education on what the true cost of implementing sustainable production practices is because it's not as much as you would think. So yeah, Screen Auckland, uh, sorry, Auckland Unlimited has um, actually been doing a interesting study with ARUP. Uh, so some of you might be aware that ARUP uh, was commissioned by uh, Auckland Unlimited and Screen Auckland to, um, to really take a... Uh, to do a study on what the emissions of uh, the screen sector, and I think the focus was predominantly Auckland, but correct me if I'm wrong, Juliet, the whole country. <laughs> so they've been, doing a, they've been doing a real kind of top-line study on what uh, our emissions as a country are. And from that study, what they've found is that our, our main um, sources of emissions are transport and catering together. Uh, together they represent 35%. Um, and then... Um, equipment was the single most, actually, which is um, the higher end purchase of equipment. Um, and I don't have the details, um, but Julia, was that embodied emissions from that? Was that from embodied emissions in equipment? 
Yeah, okay, so yeah, it's a high level. But th th those stats are going to come out in the next stage of their um, research in the next couple of weeks. But, you know, even if we look at that, you know, with 35% from catering and um, transport, those are areas that we can start targeting. Um, some producers are saying that one of the limiting factors are the presence of EV fleets, um, but that is going to change over the next little while. So I think, you know, even just thinking about the way we cater for shoots, you know, do we need to have beef and lamb every day, which, as you know from um, Pragith's chart, they were our major factors in there. So even just a simple thing of saying, we're not going to serve beef and lamb, we're only going to serve chicken as a meat, you've already like halved your emissions from catering. And that's a really easy thing to do. Cool. So that's sort of getting toward the end of us presenting and we'll just move into a little bit more of an informal kind of Q&A uh, moment. But uh, I just wanted to kind of highlight three main points that I want people to be taking away from, from what we've been talking about. Um, so just measuring is key, like whether it's about whether you're wanting to do waste reduction, whether you're wanting to do reduction of emissions, you need to measure the problem in order to know if the solutions that you're implementing are really working and to, in order to identify what are the real problem areas because it's not always the thing that you think of first or the thing that seems like the most obvious thing. Um, also just that sustainability is everyone's job. You know, this is, this is a challenge that we are all facing as an entire society as an entire world and it really is especially those of us who who live in more privileged countries more privileged positions it's our job to solve this problem to solve this crisis and lastly I just want to emphasize that collaboration is really really essential the moments that I have where I'm really able to make a difference in my role are when people are are working with me there. There's an open line of communication there. Um, you know, it's not about one of the points that Craig made that I think is so useful is it's not about being perfect. It's just about taking a step in the right direction. You know, no one working in the environmental sustainability space wants to just make people feel bad about what they're doing. We just want to, like, uffy along the good changes yeah, and, you know, I really, I see my role as being a support role. Um, so, yeah, uh, moving more into questions and comments, we have one question from Kushla Dillon. Um, is anyone aware of any discussion with the government re a taxable re rebate, like, say, the SPG for film productions that meet a 50% emission strategy? Do incentive like... Do incentives like that work? And are there case studies overseas? So um, I'll put this to Pragith and Craig, both of you, whoever wants to. Um, I, I, can't, I can't really answer that with too much knowledge, um, to be honest, right now. But what I do want to say is that um, those kind of incentives tend to focus for, on internationals, less so on domestic. But I think until we sort out our domestic situation and, the, and our domestic culture around sustainability, you, you know, it's hard to say to the internationals, you've got to be sustainable when we're not doing it in our own backyard. Um, so um, I, I would say let's just rather focus on domestic first. Um, yeah. And I can speak just to, <clears throat> not in the film, but just the overarching <laughs> country. Um, if, you can, if you can kind of prove, or the way we do it, if you can prove yourself as being a leader in a space, you earn yourself a seat at the table in those discussions with government to then propose strategy and really be quite clear about where the key blockages are and how do we unblock those blockages. Ultimately, um, kind of going back to that first point of, you know, we have financial alignment, economic alignment, legal alignment, political alignment, all those elements right now. The key area where we're struggling is creativity, actually. It's the fact that people are still kind of stuck in the inertia of their day-to-day -day work and they don't take the time to take a step back and go, wait, is there, why am I still doing it in this particular way? Is there a different way I could do that? And the reason why that happens is we're so inbound in our day-to-day -day that we don't take that step back. And I mean, we need to do that on a philosophical level anyway, all the time on our own lives, but we also need to do that. And it's when 
like a lot of the work I do tends to be on that particular point. It's really bringing everyone into the room and saying, why are we still doing this particular piece? And after a very short brainstorm, they go, oh, wait a minute, there's a way better way of doing this and it saves us money and all these incredible co-benefits. So once those kind of low-hanging fruit pieces are done, then that allows you to realize there are actually still certain areas where no matter how creative and no matter how many brains we've thrown at it, we can't get over this piece. And that's when the discussions um, kind of on the political spectrum start having a lot more weight because they're not going to say, but haven't you done your basic piece yet? Um, and then when you come with that weight, it then allows, allows various funds to then you know, present itself to start doing some large scale. I, I don't know if many of you were familiar with the emission reduction plan that just got released a few months ago. So in that particular political piece, um, I spent uh, <laughs> so long <laughs> lobbying um, for various climate change measures in that particular piece of legislation. And, and I think at least on the energy side, we've got some really great outcomes as a result. It's diversion from the original question, but it's the best I can answer it. Thank you. I think that point about um, taking a step out of your day-to-day -day will probably resonate with a lot of filmmakers, you know, because we work so hard, we work such long days, and to sometimes just to take that breath to think, could I do this differently? Just, you know, it feels a little bit too hard basket. Yeah. You know, historically we've seen so much emphasis put on individual action with climate and it le and it and it's disheartening, mm. right? Like it leads to a feeling of hopelessness. And I've I've struggled with that myself, you know, that that it just the emphasis is being put on the wrong place because as an individual, what can I really do in my own personal life to affect this massive problem? Well, actually, not really that much. But I think that one of the things that I really want to encourage people to, to think about and understand is as a, as a consumer, as an individual, we, that impact that we can have is way overemphasized. But the way that we can have the most impact as individuals is bringing it into our work bringing it into our jobs so that we're actually thinking about how do we adjust the systems that create a carbonized economy and how do we decarbonize those systems. And yes, of course, in New Zealand, we do have a big problem with agriculture in particular. Yeah. Don't stop lobbying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I am so with you here on this particular topic and I spend quite a lot of time with policymakers, with large industry, and also with people at the same time. And um, and it's really interesting because everyone almost starts pointing the f finger at the other person. So from, from the individual side, we go, well, the large corporates and government need to do something about it. And then you sit on the kind of the corporate side and they go, well, we've got the sustainable product and, you know, the old unsustainable product, which we're trying to sunset, but no one's buying our sustainable product. It's the consumer's fault for not wanting to buy the thing that we're trying to offer. Can you please buy this thing? We don't get to control what you buy. We just can offer you, you know, the more sustainable version. And then you sit on the political side and they go, we want to put this law in, but we're worried we're going to get voted out of power. And then, and you see the trilemma, right? Where if everyone points their finger at the other one, we don't really get, unfortunately, get anywhere. And it's such a drama and it's, it's one of the big stagnations It's this kind of trilemma of these three components. Um, so this is why I'm really passionate about exactly as you say, moving away from footprinting, which is individual. It's kind of like the neoliberal equivalent of climate change, you know, equivalent of if each individual person takes care of their own footprint will solve climate change. I don't think that's going to work as you very rightly said. And that's why I'm really a passion about the handprint concept of what can I do to encourage emissions outside my boundary. So for an individual person, that usually is related to what you spend your money on. Is your dollars going to extended drilling of oil in the Arctic or is it going towards making our public transport infrastructure better and paying bus driver salaries? You know, are we voting for you know, councils and, and governments that are aligned with sustainable initiatives and are we talking to our friends to also have that political might so that the politicians in power can say, yes, we can do this because we have the support from the people. And I'm still, you know, it's still a brainstorming. We need to keep brainstorming this along. And I think there's some real beauty in, in where kind of the media film 
even the documentary space can really play a part by bringing the information. Not many people realize that 50% of our emissions are agriculture, of which 45% are two animals, right? We don't, most people don't know that. And because they don't know that, they don't, they're not empowered to take the action. So how do we, in our work, you know, is there, is there a particular scene, for example, where someone is about to order like a beef pie and the other person goes, no, I'm not going to take the beef pie because it's contributing 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions. I want to take the, you know, <laughs> I don't know. There might be a waste, but we've got, to get, we've got to get those words out there so people have the awareness. And I think that's where there's enormous power. One of the things that I also find um, really motivating and inspiring working in this space specifically is thinking about the opportunity for that carbon handprint in film of communicating solutions. And and this is one of the things that I love most about my job is coming up with those solutions. And I think that the more that we find those solutions in our own workflows, in our own day-to-day, the more inspired we're all going to be as an industry to communicate the solutions. Because I think that we have this fatigue that has been identified around, you know, hearing so much about the crisis and hearing so much about how we need to fix it but not not feeling that we have any of those solutions within our immediate reach. And I think the more that we can bring solutions into this space, into this corridor, the more we are going to be able to decarbonize. But I, I also want to like totally agree with you, Kushla, on that, you know, that sense of weight on the individual. And I think that's, for me, one of the reasons why I think it's really important important to take that non-judgmental approach on your on yourselves and and setting these unachievable targets you know it's it's got to be us all together supporting each other to do this and it's got to be it's okay to not do it perfectly we're just going to take one step forward you know thank you for that very robust conversation um i do have one question that's come through on the app so i might do that first and then come to you both um, so the question was uh, from Callie Scott. I hope that I pronounced that right, sorry. Um, are there any plans in the works for sustainability manager training programs? Um, thank you for this question. This is actually something that I have been doing some work on myself. I think that it's a really important thing. We need more really skilled people to be able to step into this role. Um, at the moment, I'm just working on the level of bringing interns on board with the projects and, you know, paying them at least living wage because that's also an important part of sustainability. Um, uh, but I do, I have a, a um, training program that I would love to implement um, that's in a very kind of draft stage that I've been working on and um, that's something that I might pick up again at a later stage and um, keep running with. Yeah, but there, there are a few, you know, the international productions that have come here that have had to report, there are some really good sustainability managers in New Zealand. So there's no reason why we can't be using them on our domestic productions as well. And there's no reason why they can't be training people. So I, I just encourage you to start exploring who's out there. And if you need advice on that, come and chat to us. You know, we know most of them. Um, they're all very keen. <laughs> cool. Um to start early on your projects. Yeah, <laughs> yes, please, early. Patricia. Um, okay, you did the reconciliation of, um, of your electric vehicles and petric vehicle, petrol vehicles for your fleet. Um, <coughs> sorry, transport's a big issue, obviously, in this industry. How did you, or did you factor in disposal of the batteries at the end, and how did you reconcile that? Yes, we do. And what's the, what's the answer? So actually, we have a whole other work stream actually on the battery piece because that's um, that's a really interesting question. I think the the scale of the EV batteries, and this is a I think there's a bit of misinformation in the EV battery space as well. Um, the scale of the batteries are so large in an electric vehicle that the value of the batteries is so high that the the actual value of the battery at its end of life actually holds tremendous value because of the amount of precious materials and raw materials in there. 
We sometimes treat an EV battery like we treat a hybrid battery, which is a much smaller battery that is not so valuable. So there's an element of industry that's starting to ramp up now that's dealing with the battery recycling piece. And on top of that, there's another piece of work which we're doing um, and been actually it's tabled with the Ministry of the Environment at the moment. And that's the whole idea that we're going to, well, it's not confirmed in boy yet, but um, there might be a charge that's added on to all electric vehicles that are imported into the country to, in the event that if that bit industry doesn't ramp up and buy the batteries and recycle them, for, for whatever reason, maybe the technology has moved on and lithium ions are no longer useful, that that amount of money, that fee on the import, is then used for the recycling of the battery. So there's other work streams that are going around independently to solve that battery recycling piece. We're not going to have a huge landfill of batteries. I, I very strongly doubt that just because of how valuable the materials and there are. And it's a multi-billion dollar international business right now that's ramping battery recycling. Thank you. So um, there was one more question over here, and I think that might be yep, let's see how we go. question, probably. Hi there. Um, look, I um, commend you guys for, for, for getting this far. Is there an exemplar showcase? Um, is there a New Zealand production that has done really well with its sustainability? Um, or is there an overseas example of a production that really is an exemplar of how to go about it? And is there a way that within the next six months or that one of these funded projects could be used to create an exemplar showcase that can be shared with everybody else? Because I, I think part of the, it, it, there needs to be, um, spoon feeding is not quite the right word, but there needs to be something that is done to help people and go and say, this production has actually gone through the process beginning to end, and here's the results, sharing it for everybody else to follow with. Thank you, yeah. So um, I'm just going to answer that really quickly because we're over time now. Um, I... That is actually a piece of work that I'm working on at the moment with the current production that I'm sustainability managing to write up all of the learnings that we're doing. Um, but also this is a space where we're moving really quickly. We're learning a lot really fast. And so I would say for myself and probably for most sustainability managers, every project that they work on is going to be better and more sustainable than the last one, they're going to identify opportunities to improve, to reduce emissions more, to reduce waste more. Um, and so, yeah, it is something that I'm working on. I want to put it forward. And we're putting forward sustainable production tips as well through Greenlit, um, which will be available sometime over yeah. the next year. But, yeah, um, it's also about doing every time, doing more than the last time. But, but I also think, like, to your point, you know, just those inspiring cases. Um, there, there are actually some out of Australia more recently. Um, I, I don't know if any of you know Sarah Trisone. She's an incredible sustainability manager um, over there. And, and um, one of the cases that I've just heard about recently, I think it was Lionsgate. Um, but they, the reason they were so successful with the sustainability is because the gaffer was thinking about it the art director was thinking about it. You know, they were all thinking about it in their roles. And, um, and, and they, they actually, I'll see if I can get them to write something up from that, but it, it was a really wonderful experience for the whole crew as a result. Um, but just locally at home, we do. We've got some, you know, a lot of our like really small budget productions think about in a big way. Um, you know, um, Maori land with um, Libby down down south, they've, they've been running sus sustainable initiatives for God knows how many years, you know. So we actually do have some really cool examples right right here at home in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah explore, explore, explore in the festival scene, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, thank you all so much for coming um, and just want to point you in the direction. I don't have the slide, unfortunately, but... Um, if you want to um, hear more about the work that Greenlit's doing, you can sign up to the mailing list um, at greenlit.org.nz. Um, and yeah, thank you. Sorry for the questions that we didn't have time to get to. Thank you so much for your really great questions and for coming along to the session. Thanks, everyone. The Big Screen Symposium 2022 is brought to you by Script to Screen. 
We are grateful to our event partners, the New Zealand Film Commission, New Zealand On Air, AUT, Images and Sound, and Te Mangai Paho. Voiceover is by me, Anna Corbett, and music by Poddington Bear.